Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, we've all heard the story of the Titanic. I'm betting you've even seen the blockbuster Hollywood movie about its sinking with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, who hasn't seen that, or at least parts of it. Well, today, the story of the Connecticut man, William Sloper, who survived. But he had to live with an untrue accusation for the remainder of his life, and that was that he was able to board one of the lifeboats because he dressed as a woman to get into a women and children only lifeboat. Well, our guest today will have this story. Kathy Nelson is not only a member of the Berlin Historical Society, but she is the Librarian Emeritus of the town of Berlin, recognizing both her contributions to the library as well as her overall knowledge of the town of Berlin. She'll be along in just a moment. This week's trivia question, you can thank a man who very successfully invested in cattle futures for giving Connecticut the only one of these that we have. What is it? We'll stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients. And they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. It was April 15, 1912, about 110 years ago. It was the night that the unsinkable Titanic ocean liner did sink on its maiden voyage between England and New York. 1,500 people died in that disaster, and yet more than 700 survived. Today, we're focusing on one of those survivors, somebody whose life after the disaster was unnecessarily complicated because he had to live under the shadow of a horrible lie that was told about him. William Sloper was originally from the town of New Britain. That's where his family was well-established and prosperous. He had taken a trip to Europe for a few months and at the end of it saw a switch in his plans that would end up getting him on that ill-fated Titanic voyage. You'll hear the story thanks to Kathy Nelson. Kathy's the librarian emeritus of the town of Berlin where William Sloper ended up living out his life after returning from the disaster. Nelson's library had a copy of the fairly rare book that Sloper wrote about his father, but it also had an addendum that included his recollections of the sinking. Now, she's read it, and she knows the story well. This story does have a little bit of everything, including a famous actress from the silent screen era, Dorothy Gibson. Turns out she would factor rather prominently into William Sloper's Titanic adventure. And as you likely know, those 700 survivors were brought back to the final New York City destination by the ship, the Carpathia, which picked them up. And it was after Sloper got to the city that his nightmare scenario began. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Let's bring in Kathy Nelson. So, Kathy, when we talk about William Sloper, quite a guy here. I mean, he's a stockbroker. He's an estate manager, very well-to-do. His dad's an incredible you know, bank president, a big uh, force in the community. Everybody sort of knows the Sloper family. And, you know, he's doing fine. And he goes over to Europe for a three-month trip. Most of it, as I understand, for pleasure, but maybe a little bit on business. And he's coming back on a boat called the RMS Mauritania, which RMS, and I never do this, maybe you did, but means royal mail ship. And he ironically meets this woman named Alice Fortune, because you talk about good fortune, bad fortune, either way, his fortunes changed when he met Alice Fortune in uh, Europe. Could you tell us why that changed his fortunes? <laughs> well, a couple of things. First off, he met her at the beginning of the trip in Egypt. He was there with a friend, met the Fortune family. Their travels took him different places. And it's not until he was at the end of his trip in London that he met up with the Fortune family again. 
Alice Fortune is the one who really encouraged him to change ships and to go on the Titanic. So it's not because he was sort of romantically interested or involved and wanted to extend his stay. She actually told him to uh, try out this new boat? Yeah. Yeah, basically. So she convinces him to switch to the Titanic. So so he gets a ticket, right? Correct. He has a ticket, stateroom, the whole thing. The first day, well, I guess the only day out, <laughs> the first day anyway, the feeling was it was a beautiful ship. They had a spectacular sunset. After dinner, he met Dorothy Gibson, who was a silent movie star, and they were in the library. He was writing thank you notes to his hosts in London and so on. And Dorothy Gibson invited him to play bridge. And so as soon as he had finished his last letter, he went over and joined the group. And he was introduced to Dorothy's mother and Frederick, who was a friend of theirs, And so they had a very pleasant evening. About 11.30, he realized that they were the last passengers in the room. And so when the library steward came to ask them if they could finish up so he could close up the library and clean up, they all agreed. But Dorothy decided that it was just too early in the evening that they should take a brisk walk. So William dashes to his stateroom to retrieve his hat and coat. And he meets up Dorothy at the grand staircase. As they were walking, they realized that the deck was tilted and it felt like they were walking downhill. And they went up to the upper deck and he didn't feel like they were in any serious danger. The sea was calm. You know, there, there were a few passengers about, but no sense of urgency or anything. So then uh, an officer comes and instructs them to. He says, dress yourselves warmly, bring your life preservers, because they were stored in their staterooms, and then go on to the top deck. So he does that. He goes back to his room and, and grabs warmer clothes and the life belt, and they go up onto the upper deck, and Dorothy has brought his, her mother and Frederick with her, and they're helping each other adjust the life belts and, and just kind of milling around. Meanwhile, the sailors are preparing the lifeboats by uncovering them and lowering them to the deck. Now, one of the things I learned is apparently many of the sailors had never been on a boat. They had had a demonstration of how to lower the lifeboats, but very few had any real life experience doing this. So the growing crowd is calm, except for Dorothy, who becomes really quite upset almost hysterical. And she keeps saying things like, I'll never drive my little car again, and and other things like that. An officer asks if any passenger who'd like to uh, may get into the lifeboat and assures the group that there'll be no difficulty launching it as the sea is perfectly calm. And that later when they've had a chance to find out how much damage has been done, the ship will come and pick them up again. And the expectation was it wouldn't take very long for all this to happen. Some people, of course, did not want any part of going on to this little tiny lifeboat. It's open to the elements. It was cold out while the ship was, you remember, unsinkable. It was warm. It was well lit. Why would you want to step into this thing in the middle of the night? Frederick and William help Dorothy and her mother onto the small lifeboat, and she grabs hold of William's arm, and and she just won't let go of him. And she says, I'm not going to go unless you do. And William looked at Frederick. Frederick looked at William. And the officer encouraged them to take their seats because the boat was practically empty. A few more people climbed in. The officer asked, are there any more who would like to get in before we lower away? And nobody moved. There were only about 29 people on the boat, and it would have held easily 65. It was the first one, lifeboat number seven, I believe it is. And it was the first one that was uh, lowered to the ocean. Again, there was no sense of panic. There was, you know, a lot of people... Didn't think there was anything wrong. 
And again, the, the boat was unsinkable. That was one of the things they, you know, emphasized in the promotion. Had they told William and Dorothy and the others that the boat had struck an iceberg, or were they just thinking there was maybe some damage to the boat that wasn't quite known what it was? I don't know at that point who knew what and who was saying what. So they get in the lifeboat, they lowered them down, and was that a harrowing experience itself? Apparently, according to William, it wasn't that bad. It was a fairly smooth descent. Other people have said that it went out, went down kind of jerky. William does talk about the fact that the boat plug was not in, and so their feet were wet and cold. And I've read since that there were no provisions on the ship. There were no flares, there were no, no, no blankets, no food, emergency rations, nothing. Just six oars. Also, you know, they were not the only men. There were three sailors on this lifeboat with them, and other lifeboats also had men on them as well. Now, when you talk about Lifeboat 7 specifically, I mean, we have this great uh, recounting of what happened that evening, thanks to, to William you know, sharing his story with the media and other people, of course, who were rescued, but him specifically. So as I understand it, they said that the the lifeboat number seven went about two miles away from the ship. And I, I just can't help but try and put myself there. And as you say, there was a small hole in the boat and some water was coming in, which probably gave them reason to be a little panicky. But then they saw the Titanic go down and... Can you explain what uh, you've read about what that looked like? He wrote a uh, biography of his father, uh, The Life and Times of Andrew Jackson Sloper. As an appendix, he wrote like a 20-page story about his experience and how it was that he ended up on the Titanic and what the experience was and then the rescue from there. I mean, as I understand it, you know, first you're looking at the boat, it's perfectly well lit, you know, and then suddenly as it starts to go under, it goes perpendicular and the lights go out. I mean, that must have just been a stunning view. Exactly. He says, at any rate, two hours after our lifeboat was launched, the sailors estimated they had drifted more than two miles from where the Titanic was sinking. The ship remained until two or three minutes before she sank, as brilliantly lighted as she was directly after the accident occurred and all the lights had been turned on. Then suddenly, like the house lights in a brilliantly lighted theater, just before the curtain goes up, all the lights on the ship dip simultaneously to just a pale glow. A moment or two later, everyone watching in the lifeboats saw silhouetted against the starlit sky, the stern of the ship rise perpendicularly into the air from about midship. Then with a prolonged rush and roar, like the sound of 10,000 tons of coal sliding down a metal chute, the great ship went down out of sight and disappeared beneath the surface of the ocean. I'm so glad you shared that because I've read that very passage and it's chilling. It's absolutely chilling to hear that and to read that. Um, what I also, I guess I'd never really stopped to think about these poor people in the lifeboats after the Titanic went down, but they sat in those boats overnight and saw the sunrise the next morning with the sun glistening off the icebergs and everything before the Carpathia got there. Isn't that a neat sentence of his? It says, during the hour, the sun came out of the ocean like a ball of fire. Its rays reflected on the numerous icebergs sticking up out of the sea around us. The man wasn't a poet, but boy, he could write a good phrase here and there. Boy, he uh, certainly picked it on that occasion. Now, the Carpathia, the rescue ship, comes by, and they still, they had to row about a mile, which for anybody who's not rowed a boat, a mile is, it takes a lot out of you, but I guess they had sailors on board as well. But it's not necessarily an easy task to row a mile, but I guess if you've got salvation, you know, awaiting you, it uh, makes it a little easier. Now, they got onto the Carpathia uh, about, uh, like I said, they rode about a mile to get there. Then they had to go up some stairs when they got to the side. 
So they're on this boat now. They realize they're going to be saved, and it's heading toward New York. And they don't know the statistics yet. They don't know that 1,500 people are dead and 711 survivors and all that. But I guess they do learn that there are going to be some reporters waiting for them, or they at least surmise that when they get in toward New York Harbor. What do you know about that? Yeah. At the docks, it was a mob. Onlookers, family members, friends, and newspaper reporters all trying to find out what happened from from those who were there. Now, William was fortunate because his father and one of his brothers met him at the dock, and they took a taxi immediately down to the Astoria Hotel. William refused to speak to the New York reporters because he had a friend that, actually more than one friend, I think, who were working for the local newspapers, the New Britain Herald and the Hartford Times. And so he decided that he was only he was going to speak to them first, that he wanted to share it with the hometown reporters. And then the New York Herald reporter got a little bit miffed at that and did something unconscionable. Yeah. He basically accused Sloper of escaping by dressing up in a woman's nightgown, which, of course, was a complete lie. Sloper wanted to sue the reporter and the, and the newspaper, but his father strongly advised him to ignore it. And yet the story has lingered, even if it was just a whisper, for the rest of his life. So let's talk about that. He uh, moves to Kensington after he gets back, right, from this, this cruise, or did he live in Kensington before he left? He married in 1915, less than three years after the Titanic. So I don't know if he and his wife, Helen, uh, moved at that time or if it was later. He moves to Berlin, to Kensington section of Berlin, beautiful area, by the way, and he's right on the main road, which at the time is still a dirt road and he didn't escape attention there did he apparently not at some point a stockade fence was built around the property 10 foot high wooden fence and it was said to prevent the curiosity seekers so now as far as we know he was able to continue in his business and it wasn't terribly bad, except that this rumor did follow him for the rest of his life, didn't it? Uh, It seems to have. And it's a shame because the book that really opened up the fact that he did not dress in women's clothes was A Night to Remember. And that book came out just a couple of months after he died. So he never knew that his reputation had been restored. No, no. But on the other hand, You know, I think the best kind of revenge is he had a very successful business career afterwards. He seemed to have married well, and he lived a good life. And you survived the Titanic. And he survived the Titanic. Yeah. I also understand that he and his wife went on the boat, the Olympic, which was the sister ship of the Titanic. And I'm told They were the only survivors of the Titanic who also went on the Olympic. Do you have any knowledge of that? That's what William Sloper wrote in his book, yes. And that they happened to be sailing when uh, the anniversary of the Titanic came up. I want to say like six years later or something. So they did a a momentary remembrance of the um, occasion while they were on ship. And didn't they do it? pretty much near the same area where the boat went down? Yes, yes. It's amazing that all these years later, we are still fascinated by the Titanic and by the tragedy of what happened that night. And I think that's remarkable that we still remember. And the other thing is that William Sloper and his wife and his brothers started a scholarship fund in memory of his father, Andrew Sloper, The fund still exists today, and they still give out scholarships to New Britain uh, residents. And I think that's kind of neat that he's given back to the community in this way. This whisper of skirt behind him didn't change his 
generosity to the community. It didn't change the way he, he lived his life. And that's important, I think. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. That fence surrounding William Sloper's house in Berlin is made from a very rare type of wood. In fact, anytime it's damaged by, say, a tree falling on it, there is only one mill where the owners can turn to for replacement posts. And that mill is located more than a thousand miles away from Kensington. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Kathy Nelson, Librarian Emeritus for the Town of Berlin and a proud member of the Berlin Historical Society. Well, the answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, you can thank a man who very successfully invested in cattle futures for giving Connecticut the only one of these that we have. What is it? The answer, a zoo. And the man was James Beardsley. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, Beardsley Zoo in Bridgeport is the only accredited zoo in the entire state of Connecticut. And wait until you hear the history of how it all got started, how it's grown, and what happened to the man, unfortunately, who made it all possible. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Stay healthy.